We've talked about a few Primarchs so far, each with their own unique traits and, and upbringings. And we know that Mortarian is this, well, now disease-ridden demon Primarch of Nurgle and having fallen from grace in the in the shadow of his, his, uh, his pursuit of creating a galaxy where humans don't suffer. Uh, quite the contrary result there, huh, Morty? But uh, my, my, how that did backfire. And we've talked about uh, Lionel Johnson, uh, the, the paragon of justice in the Imperium, you know, this unflinchingly loyal, but uh, with a dark secret hidden behind him, the, the kind of the veil of his chapter. And today we're going to be going into a very different Primarch with uh, one trait in particular that sets him apart from his brothers. Uh, today we will talk about Vulcan, the master of the 18th Legion, the Salamanders. So strap into your Thunderhawks and let's dive in. And a lot of what we know about Vulcan, especially in his early life, is documented in the Promethean Opus. Uh, from here, we know a lot about the Primarch's upbringing on Nocturne, uh, another feudal death world. Uh, a lot of the human inhabited worlds of the universe were old worlds from the pre-Old Night Imperium that had uh, devolved into some form of uh, feudalism or otherwise more barbaric tribal societies. And this is, of course, no different on Nocturne. Uh, falling like a comet, and there's a bit of a, a foreshadowing in that, trust me, um, as all of the other Primarchs did, uh, as they were just kind of launched into space in their, cute, in their cute little baby Primarch gestation cubes, um, Vulcan was discovered by Inbel, his adoptive father. Inbel was a, a blacksmith for the city of Hesiod or as they're called in the Promethean society, black smithers, so I'm sorry, smiters. Uh, before I get ahead of myself, as we're going to be saying Promethean a lot more, uh, Nocturne has one very large moon called Prometheus. And this is where the Salamanders keep their fortress monastery, but they hail from Nocturne Actual. Uh, that's worth noting, so I wanted to kind of point that out. So, uh, within three years, baby Vulcan uh, had become just jacked huge strong Vulcan, uh, much larger than any other man on Nocturne. In addition to his raw strength, he, he was also uh, considerably intelligent, you know, able to improve upon a lot of the practices the smiths of Nocturne used to craft their weapons and armor, and he took up his father's uh, adoptive trade. I'm sorry, his adoptive father's trade, and Nocturne not only became, a, he not only became a uh, incredible blacksmith, but also a champion for the people of Nocturne, as he won many battles against the dreaded Dusk Wraiths. Now, we haven't talked much about the Eldar or their darker kin, the Dark Eldar, but the Dark Eldar have a whole cast of their society dedicated to gathering slaves from around the galaxy to be used in any matter of a manner of a torturous ways. Uh, you know, because it's a race of elves with at least one nipple clamp on at any one time. And a Prince Albert piercing. Ugh. So, you have this almost uh, Grecian figure of a god, blacksmithing and, and unparalleled martial skill, almost like this Hephaestus. But there's this story of how a dark Eldar raiding party came to Hesiod, his home, and attacked. Uh, of course, the dark Eldar are the uh, dusk race that they talk about. And it was the custom to just simply hide until they left. But Vulcan was having none of that. He stormed from his father's forge, hammers in each hand, and slew over 100 Dark Eldar warriors. And this had a bit of a ripple effect because it, it sort of galvanized the planet to uh, fight against the Dark Eldar and earned him the title Fireborn. Now, Nocturne then systematically cast off the kind of chains of the Dark Eldar and, and uh, bringing their battle barges down from the skies and freeing them from the tyranny of the Xenos. Uh, so before we get into this next part, uh, it's important to note how much importance <laughs> Nocturne society places on, on on contests, on tests of strength, and, and other shenanigans. It's really a means of proving themselves uh, worthy of certain praise, leadership, etc. Uh, any kind of sort of marked honor. And this is a pertinent point right now, and it will be towards the end of the video. So uh, jot that down somewhere or don't it's the future you can just rewind the video who cares right but back on track so uh, Vulcan becomes this legend he's spanning the entire planet after defeating the dark Eldar there was uh, there was much rejoicing uh, they had a grand celebration in Vulcan's name for their victory and as you would have guessed there was a bevy of contests uh, feats of strength all sorts of salamander uh, 
arts was all sorts of uh, salamander measuring. <laughs> you see what I did there? Instead of dick measuring, uh, whatever, guys. Uh, it's not just simple things like, uh, I can throw this rock further than you. They had uh, duels of craftsmanship and metallurgy. So it all had a, a kind of an artisan undertone to it. And uh, during the celebration, a stranger appears. And no one recognizes him. And he is very different from the rest of the Nocturnians. He's even dressed odd. And he makes a, a bet that he can best any man at any event in the competition. And the winner would earn the obedience and loyalty of the loser. Uh, Vulcan agreed to these terms and rose to the challenge. And the people in the crowd kind of remarked how how uh, similar in stature the two were. You know, Vulcan was this uh, was a giant by comparison to the rest of the planet, a broad-shouldered man with powerful features and a heavy brow. And the stranger was the same, but with pale skin. And that's a little another little segue uh, we'll, we'll dip into real quick. The entire peoples or population of Nocturne are pitch black. Uh, they're not African-American looking, wherein their skin is various shades of brown, nay. Uh, they are supposed to be obsidian black with red eyes, as the people of Nocturne are said to have been uh, kind of crafted by the very volcanoes themselves. And we'll talk more a little bit about how that, why they, why they are the way they are, but uh, you can imagine how this army would look on the tabletop if, if done right. So, for eight long Nocturnian days, which I unfortunately don't know how many... Terran days, that is. Uh, the Stranger and Vulcan competed in every feat of strength and test of endurance that the competition had to offer. Uh, what should have been a landslide win by Vulcan ended up in a tie in almost everything. The Stranger matched Vulcan in every event, such as the uh, anvil lift where they uh, they, they simply kind of held an anvil above their heads for as long as possible. I, I They both did it for over 12 hours. I can't even peel an orange without sweating. This went on you know, day after day until they finally decided upon a tiebreaker. Both contestants would compete in hunting a salamander. Now the rules were simple. We're pretty simple here. You had to hunt down and kill one of the, no of the Nocturne salamanders. Oh. You also have to forge your own weapon first. So there's that. But to add insult to injury, whoever brought back the largest salamander would then win. Uh, this should be an easy feat for Vulcan as he spent the majority of his childhood, you know, all four years of it. Uh, hunting the Saurian creatures that riddle the, riddle the uh, planet. So not like Lizardmen Saurian, that's just a general term. Um, but after forging their weapons, they both climbed to the top of Mount Deathfire, the home of the largest fire drakes. And that's the names of the, the fiercest and largest of the salamanders on the planet. Um, it's also a name that becomes important in the later chap in later uh, in the chapter. Um, we'll kind of go into that a little bit. But uh, Vulcan spied his, uh, his prey first. Uh, outright smacking the damn thing's head off in one blow with his massive warhammer that he crafted. And as he kind of marched down from the mountain, all fat and happy with his kill, uh, the volcano began to erupt. It threw Vulcan from his feet. He tumbled off the edge and, and held on for dear life with the fire drake held beneath him in his offhand. We kind of picture this this giant Grecian, more or less, like stapled onto a ledge with one hand. I, I kind of picture the rock. Um, several hours went by. Uh, before his grip finally started to slack, maybe if he hadn't been lifting anvils all day. Uh, and at that moment, the stranger showed up and, and chucked his fire drake carcass across the moat of lava that Vulcan was dangling over to save the day. And needless to say, the salamander to the, stra the salamander the stranger the stranger found was far bigger than Vulcan's. And upon returning to the city, Vulcan was declared the winner. But being the honorable chap that Vulcan is, he declared that any man that puts his life above pride is worthy of his service. Thus, the stranger revealed himself to be the emperor of mankind, and Vulcan the new primarch of the 18th legion, the Salamanders. So, before Vulcan can really take up the mantle, though, of, of the primarch, he has to really learn how to be a primarch. Uh, Vulcan kind of stands out from his brothers in his ability to have extreme compassion and extreme sympathy for the burden of leadership. So he really tries to go above and beyond, you know, a measure three times cut once type of person, you know. But after being rediscovered, he spends a majority of time with his father, fighting at the Emperor's side and, and absorbing all sorts of information like a giant green sponge. Uh, the armor of the Salamanders, after all, is a uh, predominantly green armor with uh, black shoulder pads and red accents. So that joke makes sense. Uh, and this is a, a different 
this is really, it's different than, than some of the other Primarchs we've talked about. Uh, Vulcan wasn't this battle-hardened, tried-and-true avatar of war like so many of his brothers before him. Instead, he came from humble beginnings with a, with a rather nurturing environment. Uh, through that, he approaches being a Primarch in, in this almost fatherly way. Hell, during his inaugural address to the 18th Legion, he even declares that he is their father, general, lord, and mentor. So, a bit more of a personal touch than his brothers before him. And as Vulcan was uh, granted command of the Legion, he got a sense for the condition that the, the Legion was truly in. And the majority of the Legion, some 19,000 Space Marines, had already been committed to various engagements, namely in the Terrace Division uh, against a, a mighty green tide of orcs. Now, they were locked in a pitch battle. They were kind of acting as a rear guard um, to allow uh, multiple planets to evacuate. And many of, of which allowed for the, uh, the full-scale evacuation of those colonial worlds, or otherwise, you know, easy targets for the orcs. And it all boiled down to uh, Antaeum, a dead world where the uh, remainder of the Legion was holed up with a mortally wounded commander, Lord Commander Cassian Vaughn. Now, the orcs seized the planet endlessly, but the salamanders did not give in. And this dedicated to kind of succeed or die in the attempt. And, that, and that's really... That's important because that's something that's a it's a bit of a repeating theme with the salamanders too they they have this kind of singular dedication to a goal or objective heedless of help or danger or anything like that so it's kind of an important note to kind of have here because uh they are, are definitely uh, steadfast in their pursuit of justice but vulcan found out about this and immediately changed his plans to help out his embattled sons uh gathering up the first of the initiates out of nocturne uh, vulcan made for the terrorist division uh, spending a great deal of time within the holy forges of Terra and Mars, uh, Vulcan learned much alongside his uh, his brother Ferris Manus. And he, Ferris actually was uh, rediscovered just before Vulcan. And from that knowledge, he kind of brought all of the munitions that he had custom built for his already outstanding craftsmanship, craftsmanship with uh, all manner of weaponry. Because he kind of, he custom built armor, he kind of re... Um, configure certain weapons and the such, so he kind of uh, had at it across the board. Now, armed to the teeth, uh, blasting the shaft opening theme and ready to deliver justice for the Emperor, El Vulcan fell upon Antaeum. Uh, he destroyed the largest of the space hulks that orbited the planet, and this spurred the remaining salamanders to fight back in a grand hammer and anvil attack that broke the back of the orcs and sent them reeling into space, uh, freeing the remainder of the 18th Legion. And there's this beautifully poetic moment where, uh, upon seeing their liege lord, the Terran-born Salamanders drop to their knee immediately. And Vulcan, he had them rise and told them that he was no king, that they were all equals. And then in, in this like glorious Return of the King callback, he and the rest of the Nocturne-born Salamanders uh, bowed in reverence for the Marines lost in their valiant defense. And uh, Vulcan even delivered the power claw that wounded Lord Commander Vaughn to his feet for the official and formal transfer of Legion Mastery. And they would fight for Vulcan, and Vulcan would fight for them. And that's kind of a really big distinction here, right? Is that you don't have this singular powerhouse who goes, look at me, I'm the head of a Primarch. I have all my sons behind me at all times. You have this Primarch who fights for his Legion, his Legion fights for him because they both believe in each other so, so deeply. And it's kind of an interesting relationship that he sort of gleans off of a lot of his relationship with the Emperor. He seems to have a very close emperor, uh, relationship with the Emperor that is uh, cheated by most of the other his other brothers. But thus begins the uh, reforging of the Legion in Vulcan's image, uh, following the Promethean Creed that was essentially this uh, a treatise on how to be a righteous, honorable, and diligent member of not just the Salamander's Legion, but the Imperium as a whole. It was basically said that if you wanted to be a Salamander, you had to you had to adhere to the Promethean Creed. And Vulcan wanted to create a common ground for all of his men to operate under. Um, it's not like the warrior lodges of some of the traitor legions, but um, he wanted them to feel like they had a say in a lot of the stuff that went on in the legion. They weren't just, you know, um, cogs in a cog machine of cogs. But as they restructured the legion on Prometheus, that moon we discussed earlier, uh, he went to work crafting a legion that served both the lessons he learned under the emperor and the tenets that the were ingrained in him as a Nocturnian. Now, most Space Marine Legions, um, they really kind of throw their Terran-born proto-Legionnaires, you guess you could say, to the wind. You know, every time a, a new Primarch is discovered, they already have an existing Legion that they can 
slot into, and those are all Terranborn Marines. Mostly, uh, they kind of ostracize them or, or alienate them outright, and this is especially true in any Legion that turned traitor with Horus. You know, we take a look at some of the other ones, and some of them outright were just kind of like thrown to the dogs. So, Vulcan had different plans. He venerated the individuals that remained after the events of Antaeum. Uh, he granted seven of them the strongest, he kind of granted the, the, the seven strongest and bravest, and really the most veteran amongst them, to become his personal Pyre Guard. And Pyre Guard was uh, these seven, which is actually no, which is actually a number that's very important to Nocturnian culture. Uh, they would act as not only Vulcan's honor guard, but also his chapter masters. They would lead large swaths of the Legion. And they had this badass mantra that they shot on the battlefield as they charge in. Eye to eye, tooth to tooth, tooth to tooth. Just glorious. And you're probably thinking that the Terranborn Marines were paler or, or fairer complexion. Nay, 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 nay. Um, as soon as they arrive in Nocturne, the unique radiation of the planet reacts with the gene seed. And it turns them um, onyx black with red eyes, just like everyone else, just like their father and their commander. Um, as for Cassian Vaughn, he was venerated as the first master of the 8th, 18th Legion and was interred within a specially crafted dreadnought called the Iron Dragon. Uh, handcrafted by Vulcan himself. Um, from there, he would uh, wage war eternal. And in turn, the 18th Legion would shake off the name Pyreguard, uh, reserved, and that was the name that they used to have. It reserved now for the elite of the Legion and adopt the name the Salamanders, uh, named, of course, after the fire drakes of the world of Nocturne, whose blood was fire and hides are as hard as steel, albeit also fire resistant. But Salamanders themselves are loyal and ferocious beasts, able to defend, to, uh, defend their own steadfastly. Uh, this would echo throughout the Legion with the uh, Kasare, or the name of the greatest of the Salamanders, um, at their head. And we'll, we'll talk about why Kasare is an important thing in a bit. Uh, but the bleached skull of a Kasare uh, becomes the, the kind of symbol of the chapter reunited. So, as they took to the stars, the Salamanders were a tempered fighting force, using their wisdom, battle prowess, and uh, ferocity to exact not just lasting vengeance across the expanding frontier of the Crusade, but also to breed uh, temperance to their cousins. Uh, they fought with this kind of uh, this stoicism and this, this humility, and this uh, they really considered this very surety of action. They're, they're very um, confident in what they did. It was a stark contrast to the 18th, to the, uh, the 18th Legion prior to Vulcan, which was a more hot-headed legion. And it is said that the Salamanders are slow to anger, but once roused to the occasion, they have a volcanic fury. In one of their initial engagements, the Salamanders teamed up with the Death Guard and the Iron Hands, uh, all led by their respective Primarchs at the world of Caldera. They fought against Eldar before finally taking to the planet to find that the world's savage humans were venerating the Eldar. So it's it's kind of a weird story, but in the past, um, the Eldar had ended the reign of a dark Eldar raiding party, much like what happened on Nocturne. And the Eldar had been guarding the planet as it had been an access to the webway on the surface. So Vulcan and his pyre guard were revealed um, this truth by the Emperor in, in, in the disguise of a Remembrancer. And after bringing the planet to heal and destroying the populace, it was ready for recolonization. The Great Crusade proceeded very much the same way. Uh, one incident of note is when Conrad Kurz and Vulcan came to blows on the planet of uh, Karatan. Uh, Vulcan dis disagreed with Kurz's method of brutality and, and sowing fear in the populace for obedience. This Little Tiz would come back later in their lives, but this is this is the root of it all. The animosity between the Salamander and the Lord of the Night. And trust me, it, it is important to know why they have an animosity. But eventually, Horus fell from grace and became a traitor to the Imperium, taking many legions with him. In that grand act that we know so well, uh, Istvan V, uh, the aim was to bring Horus to heel to answer for his crimes. Uh, seven legions would ally against his four legions in a massive but hopefully short civil war. And we've talked about this before, but it definitely bears worth uh, bringing up again. And I'd really, like to, I'd really like to go into the gritty detail of this entire engagement, uh, especially the fight along the Urgal Depression. 
uh, the kind of ebb and flow of this battle and the ultimate defeat of the Loyalist Marines. But I think it really deserves its own video to do it proper justice. I mean, I, I want to have like a like a map of everything and bring you guys kind of like along the journey of this campaign. Uh, let me know in the comment section below if that tickles your pickle and we can get into it. But uh, I, will, I digress, sorry. But needless to say, though, the drop site massacre uh, went just as it is named. The Iron Hands had extended too far. You know, Ferris Menas uh, was rich with bloodlust as he confronted his former best friend and brother Fulgrim. Fulgrim, who was in the uh, throes of this uh, possession, cut off Ferris Menas's head. And Vulcan and Korax, who had tried to get Ferris Menas to flee alongside them, started to evacuate their marines from the planet. And as you read this in the books, it's it's this heart-wrenching, tragic moment. Uh, Fulgrim and Ferros uh, were very close, and Vulcan and Korax are galvanized from the start as they are both paragons of justice within the, the Imperium, you know? They believe that they were going to change Horus as they were as they're like fleeing across the Urgal Depression, there's a lot of hope, right? You know, they're they're getting away. They've they've they've, they've spotted the ruse. It's time for us to it's time for us to bounce, homie. Like we got it. Let's get up and out of here, or else we're gonna die. I mean, I I know the history here. And as they approach their landing site, they see the motionless form of the entire Fourth Legion, the Iron Warriors, standing on the ridge, not moving or responding to anything. Any hails on the box, nothing. There's just this terrible moment where Vulcan and Perturabo make eye contact, and he knows. Vulcan knows what's about to happen. And over 10,000 guns unleash all at once, gunning down salamanders endlessly as large cannons empty fusillade after fusillade um, into the Emperor Emerald Sea of Marines. And if you've learned one thing about the salamanders, you've learned that their thirst for tenacity, and as each trudging foot uh, forward brought more and more death behind, the Legion advanced against the staccato of gunfire that etched its way through their ranks. Massive rocket batteries unleashed more destruction, tossing Marines around like rag dolls. I mean, there's a, there are armaments that were meant to break walls and siege planets. The Iron Warriors were excellent at all forms of siege craft, so they brought everything to bear on one of the most stubborn of Space Marine Legions. The Pyre Guard they kind of led the way with their Primarch, each gunshot drawing more and more blood from his dying Legion and this kind of massive orbital strike uh, managed to break the back of the Salamanders, destroying a massive massive swath of the Legion and almost annihilating the Primarch himself. And it's it, it's really a terrible moment because you kind of, in the old books, it went that Vulcan went missing for a bit then found himself back on Nocturne as the Legion all uh, retreated to heal. That's kind of what happens here. Like in, in the books, it talks about how people kind of stow away on individual Thunderhawks, both Salamander and... Um, Oh man, and, and Raven Guard alike, just trying to get away from the planet. But that is not the case. And, and th this is where the story of Vulcan gets really dark. Um, Vulcan was actually captured on Istvan V by the Night Hunter himself, Conrad Kurz, the Primarch that Vulcan had scorned for his brutality shortly before this old debacle is now his captor. And shit, guys, if you don't know anything about Conrad, then you don't know how god-awful a position this is to be in. I mean, for months, Vulcan was tortured endlessly by Kurz. The Night Hunter was dedicated to breaking both Vulcan's mind, body, and spirit. And he takes a great deal of uh, sadistic joy in that. Trust me, I've read a lot. But uh, something became amiss. Uh, the goal was to break him and then kill him. But through frustration, Kurz could not break him and simply went, out, went on to kill his brother. Instead, Vulcan just regenerated. And it's revealed in the book, um, Vulcan Lives, that Vulcan is actually a perpetual. And this enrages Kurz like no other. There, there's, there's a segment in the book where it's it's just death after death after death from Conrad. Uh, he beheads Vulcan, he stabs him in the throat with cutlery. Ugh. Um, tears him apart with his power claws, shoots him to death with bolters, uh, um, empties him into the void of space, eviscerates him everything. Still, Vulcan comes back to life. And this triggers and worsens Kurz's insanity as Vulcan um, inherited the gene from his father that allows him for continuous cellular regeneration, effectively making him truly immortal. Um, space Marines are not immortal, despite what you might think. They, I mean, I, I don't know of any stories of them dying of old age because they die way before that, but they can die of normal causes. Well, <laughs> as normal as like a tyranny to the face is. So he's actually immortal, though. He, he will not degrade in any way, shape, or form. So... Kurz returns to trying to break Vulcan's spirit by convincing him he's just as much of a monster as he is. Um, enter 
the next Saw movie, Warhammer 40,000 edition. Uh, Kurz wants to play a game, basically, right? I want to play a game. So he rigs up all these elaborate traps, rooms, scenarios, uh, where Vulcan just can't win. It's stacked against him. Uh, one of my favorites is he's being interred in this... Uh, uh, Vulcan's interred in this, this battle plate that he can't control as it kills innocent captured soldiers and, and loyalist marines. Uh, there's another one where he's kind of got to like, where uh, he's got to hold up this like rock slab and if he, if he drops it, it'll crush all these other people um, that are innocent. Like it, uh, situations that kind of test the ultimate honor of Vulcan and just all manner of mental torture, even using uh, Davenite sorcerers to convince him that he's fighting Korax. Nothing would break the resolute salamander primarch. The Night Hunter had one final gambit. He put Vulcan in a giant maze constructed by Perturabo, which would shift and change, not allowing for someone to navigate it properly, and mentally too, because all primarchs have eidetic memory and they can kind of navigate their way through things and remember where they were. So this would even con this would even confuse a primarch. And it was intended to drive the inhabitant mad. And in the center was Vulcan's hammer, Dawnbringer, which Kurz told Vulcan that if he acquired it, he would grant him his freedom. That chance. But the Night Lord ambushed the Salamander throughout the entire ordeal, kind of injuring him and staggering him and poking him, but not killing him. And eventually Vulcan was granted a vision by the Emperor himself, uh, confronting him and letting him know that he would look over his sons whenever he could. And it's this very kind of... I know I use this term a lot, but it's a sweeping romantic moment because this is a space opera. There's a lot of bromance going on. Um, and it's kind of this kind of... Notification is this this kind of affirmation to Vulcan saying like, hey, I haven't abandoned you, but I know you're stronger than this. And I know that you don't need me right now to actually intervene. You need to intervene on your own behalf. And this aided in stealing Vulcan's resolve. It renewed and reinvigorated him. And he, he started to taunt courage. You know, he told him that his brother pitied him for, for being the weakest of the Primarchs and, and really just tried to lay him low. And this led to a duel between the two where Kurz foolishly thought he could take Vulcan on with his bare hands. Sure, because anyone who specializes in blacksmithing isn't going to have a grip like that of 10,000 sons. Whatever. But uh, Vulcan picked up Kurz and used his body to smash apart the energy shield protecting Dawnbringer. Um, and thumbing the hidden teleportation vice on the hammer, Vulcan was teleported half a galaxy away, above Macrag, the homeworld of the Ultramarines. Um, Vulcan then turns into a gigantic salamander's meteor, Remember, like I said, foreshadowing, that uh, strikes the, the planet of McCrag. And being a perpetual, this isn't too big of a deal, but the re-entry process caused his brain to get a badly scrambled by the immense pain. It shut down the majority of his psyche. As he kind of regained con consciousness, though, he did not know where or who he was. And as Lionel Johnson came to the planet in an event known as uh, Imperium Secundus, uh, something we'll delve into deeper with the... Uh, Rogugiumen lore, he inadvertently brought the Night Hunter with him. So, just as a real quick segue, it's it's such a deep, deep, deep portion, I want to get into it, but Imperium Secundus is an initiative started by the Emperor that said, hey, in the event that I die, you have to, you, my brother, you, my sons, have to create another empire. Um, it's like an extreme contingency plan. So, when the Ruin Storm cuts off all the, the entirety of the galaxy, the Ruin Storm is this massive warp uh, storm, then Ro... Uh, Robo Geeman, Bobby G, tells Sanguinius and Lionel Johnson that we have to start Imperium Secundus. Boom. That's your quick little segue. There's your crash course in it. Um, so the ensuing fight is this crazy story of buildings blowing up, Kurs going wild on the enemy, on everyone, and the three Primarchs getting in a giant fight that Vulcan breaks up to beat Kurs to a pulp. Now Vulcan is then stabbed by a piece of what's called Fulgerite, which ultimately truly kills him as... Fulgerite is the glass-like substance left over from the psychic residue of the Emperor smiting chaos some millennia or so ago. So this gives him, you know, if you've watched Altered Carbon, it gives him real death. It gives him true death. He's, he's dead now. The Salamanders, though, are shattered. The only small remnants and pockets of the once proud Legion left are, are all of which are kind of hobbling through the galaxy, trying to find a way to return to their beloved Nocturne. Uh, some of which have found themselves on a crag, you know, standing vigil over the casket of their deceased, de deceased gene father. The first captain, Artelius Numian, is eventually discovered by an ultramarine strike force and reunited with his brothers on a crag. 
And this is important because the first captain, as we know from every single other legion, has a lot of sway and has is like, you know, the Primarch and then the first captain, like hand in hand. But um, Numean has, has kind of claimed this battle chant, you know, Vulcan lives. Numean was uh, sure that Vulcan was alive, despite what claims he had heard. And upon reaching the casket, it was found to be empty. So now you have this weekend at Bernie's thing going where everyone's running around trying to find a dead guy or at least a supposed one. And then eventually uh, Vulcan's body is discovered a few days later in a statuary garden uh, not far from where he was interred. Uh, Bobby G sort of theorizes that it was a function of Dawnhammer which had been buried with him. Uh, which, I'll be honest, seems a little negligent. I mean, come on. Someone named a Perpetual? I'll let him chill on ice a bit before I give him a teleporting Warhammer and a shattered mind, but neither here nor there. It's kind of in this moment that Numean, the first captain of the Salamanders, reforms uh, him and the remaining 67 Salamanders as the Pyre, a brotherhood with the intent of bringing Vulcan back to Nocturne and piercing the Ruin Storm, that grape warp storm we talked about that was cutting off the entirety of the Imperium. Like You couldn't see, when you went to go travel through the warp, you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see the uh, guiding light of the Astronomicon, nothing like that. And this is generally regarded as a bad idea from Bobby G. But Sanguinius and the Lion uh, give their consent, and eventually Bob kind of concedes. So Numean then goes on this kind of Homer's Odyssey-level return epic back to Nocturne. Hell, their ship was even named Charybdis. <laughs> Can't get more Greek than that. But the Death Guard and uh, word bearers were in hot pursuit of the aircraft, as, or I'm sorry, the spacecraft, as a Fulgurite could be used to kill the Emperor, and another Perpetual, because the Emperor obviously is Perpetual, so they wanted the Shard for themselves to help them take over the, take out the Empire, or Emperor. And as the ship uh, cannot defend against the combined might of both legions, a final gambit is kind of pulled here. Uh, the remaining 20 members of the Pyre evacuate the Charybdis as the remaining crew sacrifices the ship upon the enemy's guns. And the Pyre uses a Thunderhawk to descend to Nocturne. En route, the ruse is sprung and the Thunderhawk has to make a crash landing on the Serbian plain. Now, one thing that Vulcan told the Emperor before taking up the mantle of Primarch was that Nocturne would always be defended, and the remaining salamanders under Lord Chaplain Nomus Riton rushed to the aid of the downed Thunderhawk, sweeping up the pyre and returning to Draconis Gate, one of the new bastions that the planet had created you know, in wake of the Istvan Five Massacre. They realized that they would probably have to deal with um, invasions from their brother legion, so they created all these many bastions across the planet. And from there, they annihilated the Death Guard to a man, completely freeing the planet from the oppression of their corrupted brothers, just like uh, Vulcan did to the Dark Eldar not too long ago. So with their epic over, their mission was complete. The Pyre could see the proper burial ceremony of Nocturne, I'm sorry, of Vulcan, and remembrance of Vulcan's passing. And all the remaining Legion was present, a mere 700 Space Marines. Adorned in full battle regalia, with his Warhammer Dawnbringer in hand, Vulcan was lowered into the roiling magma of Mount Deathfire, the same volcano that he climbed during his trial of strength with his father, an age having passed since. What was once a broken legion scattered to the wind was now a mourning chapter of brothers, renewed in their faith and dedication. With proper closure, they could kind of rise from the ashes of their past and be reborn. Artelius and Numian had seen innumerable miracles up to this point, you know, facing the many ordeals that the Pyre had to go through, um, doing everything he could to get back to his brothers in the first place, but there was still one more miracle that the first captain needed. He had been racked with guilt ever since they returned, so he kind of stowed away into the night. He climbed Mount Deathfire, and uh, completely naked, and, and gave himself to the volcano. It's, it talks about one, one pocket of uh, the volcano just, oh, just in, in enveloping him. Uh, but he knew that his sacrifice would bring his Primarch back to life, purely on faith alone, without any empirical evidence. And as three of his friends went out in search of him, they found a man slumped to his knees, I'm sorry, on his knees in the desert. And once they got closer, they found that it was actually Vulcan, their Primarch and father. Vulcan lives. Now, unfortunately, the story hasn't finished yet for Vulcan and his salamanders during the Horus Heresy. In the current lore, until more Horus Heresy books come out, they essentially take a backseat to the Heresy, only really kind of getting involved in minor skirmishes as their numbers are so vastly depleted. I mean, when Robut Guillemin goes to reform the Adeptus Legionis into the Adeptus Astartes, 
Along with the Codex Astartes, uh, during the reformation of the Imperium, Vulcan is in um, opposition alongside Lehman Russ and Rogel Dorn. They, they don't want that. They're like, no, no, no. Our legions are small enough as it is. We don't need to deal with this. But eventually they kind of all agree to see eye to eye here. You know, they don't want to start another civil war. But the Salamanders are already so depleted that there's no real point in creating successor chapters. For the most part, the Salamanders live a life of relative common obscurity. It's not to say that they're not space marines, but um, they aren't at the forefront of imperial history. And for a long time, were a rather minor chapter in the grander scheme of the lore. I mean, their biggest spotlight was always been during the uh, old Armageddon campaigns, when they would kind of come back and defend Armageddon. But as for Vulcan, his end is open to a lot of conjecture. Uh, he led the Salamanders for three more millennia after the Horus Heresy, but then disappeared, leaving behind the Tome of Fire. Uh, this tome chronicles the location of nine artifacts that the Salamanders must find and return back to Nocturne. After all nine have been recovered, the Primarch will deem the chapter worthy of his leadership. Remember what we were talking about? How there's a bunch of trials of strength that all ultimately lead in the eventual you know, worthiness of some sort of action, in this case, leadership? Well, here we go. Um, and five of the nine have already been found and are either on Prometheus or being currently wielded by the chapter's Forge Father, which is their name for a chapter master. Uh, Vulcan, Estan. Um, the Spear of Vulcan, Kassar's Mantle, Kassar, there we go, guys, and the Gauntlet of the Forge. Those are the three that are actually on Vulcan Hestan himself. While the other two reside in the Fortress Monastery, Chalice of Fire and the Eye of Vulcan. The last four artifacts, Engine of Woes, the Obsidian Chariot, the Unbound Flame, and the Song of Entropy are still awaiting the Forge Father to discover. Uh, but just like many of the other lost Primarchs, the legends say that when all such artifacts are gathered, uh, Vulcan will return to lead the Salamanders in the final war against the ruinous powers. For after all, Vulcan lives. All right, guys, that kind of concludes our video here today on the mighty Primarch of the 18th Legion, Vulcan. Uh, many people think that Vulcan is a very likely candidate for one of the next Primarchs to return to us in the 8th edition of Warhammer 40,000. And I mean, it's entirely possible. Uh, will Games Workshop pass up on the opportunity to bring Lehman Russ, the Primarch of arguably one of the most popular Space Marine chapters of Space Wolves? Mm, doubtful. <laughs> but uh, I hope you enjoyed the video today, and please, please, please comment below and let me know what Primarch you would like to see next. I'm sorry it took me so long to get this one out, but I'll speed up the uh, time to getting these Primarch videos out for you all. But uh, as always, guys, go ahead and pop a like on this video if you enjoyed the content. Subscribe up for more 40k and Warhammer Fantasy lore, and have a good one, and take care.